Okay. Okay, is that my, is that my uh, checkered flag? Yep, all you. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, delighted that uh, we could uh, learn together this morning about a extraordinary person. This is the fifth in a series of art lectures that came out of an article I wrote about the outsized uh, influence of Jewish artists on American modernism. And um, um, uh, this artist is as special, or I feel more so than the others, all of whom were much um, uh, more well known. And I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Kahilat Hanahar, the little shul on the river that's hosted this series. And many of the uh, people on are friends from the temple. So I'm glad that. Uh, you're here. Uh, I gotta erase this. Got it. Okay. So um, we're here to talk about uh, Miriam Shapira, which, as I said uh, uh, in the beginning when we were just gathering, I'm sure very few of you heard about. And if you heard about her, you probably didn't know much about her. I discovered her a couple of years ago at a regional art show that I saw. I think in Connecticut, which was the artists of the p and which is pattern and decoration movement of the 70s. And she was figured uh, very, very principally in that group. And, and the work knocked me out. I was um, stunned at how gorgeous it was, first of all, beautiful, and that it used fabrics and ribbon and paper and wallpaper uh, in these collages that were extraordinary, and not least hers. So, Miriam Shapiro, she uh, was born in 1923 in Toronto. Hey, should I share the screen now? What's that? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Unless Let's... people want to just look at me the whole <laughs> time, which would be a disaster. Let's check. So, okay. So um, she was over a six decade career, um, a painter, sculptor, printmaker, and most notably a pioneer of feminist art. Um, she lived in New York City with her husband, Paul, in the 50s and 60s, and she was very much a part of the abstract expressionist scene, which we've covered previously was very much a male dominated scene that in the early 50s um, rotated around uh, something that was called the club, Milton Resnick and the Cedar Bar. And she was friends with all of the significant first and, and second generation New York school artists. Uh, over her career, uh, and she really involved herself in virtually every genre of art. What she became most famous for, which we'll go through uh, pretty uh, uh, richly, I think, was um, what she called fromage, which was using a collage um, women's craft in artwork and sculpture. And this included all of the domestic materials that were always relegated to women's work. And in particular, she uh, felt it was critical to honor women, uh, women artists, women homemakers, um, uh, who were doing women's work that she found a way to honor and celebrate. And she also pays homage, as we'll see, to uh, women artists of the past that she admired, Mary Cassatt, Frida Kahlo in particular, Sonia Delaney, and the great women artists of Russia. And uh, finally, in her last uh, years, as we'll see, she returned really at the end to the question of her identity, which was always a preoccupation for her, uh, to her identity specifically as a Jew. She was famous for saying and I found references to this all the way through my reading. If I repeat the shape of my being enough times, will that shape be seen? Uh, and just uh, to give some 
sense of her um, uh, importance, uh, at least recognized institutionally. She's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the National Gallery of Art, MoMA, the Met, Pennsylvania Academy of Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and dozens of museums around the world and around the country. And she has given uh, a real impetus and is used and, and is referred to by many of the great uh, women artists uh, right now, including Emma Amos, Sheila Hicks, Faith Ringgold, Hannah Wilka, Mary Kelly, Mira Shore, Polly Affelbaum, Deborah Koss, Joyce Kosloff, and many others. And even if we all don't really know her well, as well as some of the great artists, she is well known and taught and inspired many artists over the last uh, decades. Okay, with that, let's uh, turn to uh, Miriam Shapiro, who, by the way, really liked being called Mimi. So I might call her Mimi from time to time. She also, when, and when she was told that some of her work reminded someone of Matisse, and she said, I love Matisse, I'm just memifying Matisse. So this uh, slide, is a picture of young Miriam around the time that she got married to Paul Brock in 1946. They met at uh, the University of Iowa where they were uh, both matriculating and while she was there that she founded the uh, Iowa Print Group. Um, her parents, her father was uh, Theodore Shapiro and her mother was Fanny Shapiro. I love that. I love any Fanny I've ever met. Um, Theodore was a, a design, industrial design artist, much like Abraham over there. And he is the one that really fostered her desire to become an artist. And he taught her and he mentored her, which she finally, at towards the end of the career, finally comes to grips with because she was very conflicted about being um, mentored and manipulated by a male artist, which was her exclusive experience in New York City in the 1950s. Her mother, Fanny, uh, was really a homemaker and an ardent Zionist, and, uh, but she also very much encouraged her art. Her grandfather, Russian Jew, uh, uh, notably uh, invented the first moving movable eye for dolls. And dolls were a big deal for her. And we see it in her work right to the end. Uh, and he also was a manufacturer of teddy bears. So Miriam starts drawing at age six. She studied with Victor D'Amico at MoMA when she was still a teenager. She attended classes as part of the Federal Art Project, uh, went to University of Iowa where she met her husband. They got married in 1946. They had their son, uh, Peter, here, seen here in 1954. I've been unable to find anything about Peter and my understanding from one of the galleries that represent her is that he was uh, ill and you really don't find reference to him uh, over the course of her career that I could see, which could also be part of her conflicted views of motherhood, family, uh, parenting, and life as an artist. Uh, next. So uh, She's in New York City in, nine, in the 50s, and she is producing a substantial amount of work as a young artist between 1953 and, and, and thereafter. In 1957, she has her first show, which is a big deal with the Emmerich Gallery. She has uh, this screen on the left. She is posing with what she called her imaginary museum, and this was uh, her uh, museum of portraits that were made by artists or artists that she admired and including Picasso and Degas and Toulouse-Lautrec and Charlie Chaplin, as well as uh, what she considered modern masterpieces like uh, Les 
Demoiselle de Davignon by Picasso, a nude descending a staircase by Duchamp, Gertrude Stein, Brancusi's Little French Girl. These were things that inspired her, um, all really part of the male canon. She is holding that up, but she is looking uh, away from the masters to her own assertive fluid drawings of dancers, which is fully manifested in uh, Fanfare, which is the screen next to it, which she took this idea of the dancer and she was preoccupied with dance for a lot of her life and created this piece, which is no small piece. And I, you know, Jerry wanted me to remind everybody up front that the work she did was monumental, that so much of her, some of her work spanned 50 feet when we look at anatomy of a kimono, that much of it was six feet by 12 feet, covered whole walls and rooms. Uh, this was 60 by 105 inches. This was shown at the Emmerich uh, Gallery to uh, very good reviews. So she is uh, really on her way as an abstract expressionist, very de Kooning-like, who she was influenced by, but she is very soon to make her own mark. Next. So uh, here, is, uh, here is really the first uh, development that she started to claim her own voice. She took these uh, masters, uh, the one on the left being the pastoral con uh, concert by Giorgione, um, it's in the Louvre, and uh, she admired it. And in fact, for good reason, it's considered one of the classics of, of, um, uh, of art. And she took it and she created what she entitled Fête Champêtre, she did it in 1954, um, and it's an extraordinary piece of work. She's a young artist, but it became quite celebrated as you'll see on the next page. And one of the things that she did, which was unique, was in addition to abstracting these forms that she admired so that they're still actually recognizable, she also thinned the paint so that she called it painting thinly and wiping out. We're a little reminiscent of Helen Frankenthal or Silk and Stain. Um, uh, but this was really her first major work that drew a lot of critical attention. Uh, next. There is yours truly standing in front of this piece of art. It's, it's in um, a gallery in New York uh, and uh, the Eric Firestone Gallery. They happen to be the exclusive represent, representative of uh, Miriam Shapira's work. And then uh, this can be yours for $760,000 if anybody's interested. Uh, but I reprinted the review that she got because it was by Dorian Ashton, 1954, Art Digest. And, and I think it was remarkable and really confirmed early on how extraordinary an artist she was. This was at the Tanager Gallery. An unabashed love of lusty color and Baroque effusion is apparent in Miriam Shapiro's canvases. She is a young abstract painter who has established a contemporary style based on sound classical principles. That is, she knows and loves the great range of possibilities open to a knowledgeable painter. They are, for example, many passages in her image of a dense wood which is painted with the cunning of an old master. And when it suits her purpose, she's not afraid to use diminishing values or classical perspective. But the verve, concern for complex space and ambiguity is wholly modern. Her forest and its infinite variety quivers with an energy emanating from within and is obviously a direct unmitigated projection of the artist's complex vision she is one of the most gifted of the younger painters. And Dory Ashton was no um, small potatoes. She was one of the principal um, um, uh, judges of art and critics. 
And standing in front of it, I can say that it emanated uh, an extraordinary force. So um, let's move to the next one. Here again uh, is a piece that um, we painted again, uh, taking a, a, a very famous painting, St. George and the Dragon, Tintoretto, uh, and renaming it and claiming it for herself based on, and these, she only had black and white photographs of these pieces, uh, which I'm uh, astounded about the color she used in it because apparently it was just black and white she was working off of. Um, but she called it Beast, Land, and Plenty. And again, you can see the broad brush strokes, the swirling forms. This is a raw emotional energy. And again, the painting was thinned with turpentine and manipulated with these wiping gestures. She actually wanted to call this uh, painting after St. George and the Dragon. She wanted to call it St. Georgina slaying the dragon. Next. These next four paintings that were all uh, two here and two to follow, all uh, painted in 1959. She has now abandoned the world of fantasy and fluid abstracting these old masters. And she did a number of them, not just those two, to sort of delve into uh, more psychological and existential realities of her own life, childhood, motherhood, family, uh, in each of these, and they uh, um, have increasing complexity to them, we'll see this. That, and for further study, you can read what's been written about each of them of the mother and the child, which we can see on the left. And uh, similarly, the mother wearing an apron and the child at the bottom on the right, she calls it autobiography but it's, uh, it becomes increasingly manifest in her work in the 60s in particular, uh, that it becomes more and more autobiographical. Next. So uh, she is now uh, in these last two, um, utilizing really a, a cubic uh, uh, forms to um, create uh, hey, Ma, I just heard she's on. Um, to create, again, this depiction, complex depiction of family, um, including the last one, uh, House of Artists. And she sees herself as part of this genealogy of artists, but she is still very sensitive to the fact that it's a male uh, dominated world. It is modern art is still the bastion of male artists in her view. She's conflicted by her own ambition, which she feels is really a combination of male and female. She's conflicted about uh, her uh, being a mother, uh, having a mother that's never really gone outside the confines of her home having a father that's the one that's taught her how to paint and how to be an artist. Uh, next. So uh, 1960, she starts doing a whole new kind of work that's to become known as shrines. And, and she does these pieces and they're, they're gorgeous and they become increasingly specific uh, she was uh, apparently had a down period. She was unhappy with her work and she created these uh, very symbolic uh, 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 pictures that represented different aspects of her life. So they were very autobiographical um, and uh, increasingly specific. Uh, next. So um, in these, you can see on the left, she's introduced a new element, a large egg. And the egg and the ovoid shape 
and the womb and this space uh, starts to reappear, to appear in all of her work. And also the tower. So you have sort of this, you know, phallic shape that she is contending with as well as her, her female essence. And we see it repeated over and over. And critics had a great time trying to describe this in all sorts of ways, as did she. Uh, she and she happened to describe it a little more crudely than I'm prepared to, uh, to share. But um, this becomes known as her shrines. Um, next. Now you can see where it's really getting uh, very, very specific, very structural. Uh, and she repeats this over and over. And, and these are dramatic. I, I actually saw one of these and it's one of the things that really blew me away. Uh, on the left, you can see moving top down, she has this gold, which represents aspiration for her. Below that, was an image of uh, the history from the history of art that she admired. This happens to be Cezanne, and this piece is called Homage to Cezanne. Then you have the egg, which, as she describes it, uh, is the woman, the creative person, the I. And then finally, underneath is the mirror. And the mirror is something that we'll see repeating throughout her work. Um, and the mirror is what she looks into, looking into herself and looking to the future. Um, these shrines, and the next one is another shrine, and the artwork is uh, two paint tubes, which I forget which museum it's in right now, but they, uh, it's one of their most celebrated pieces of art. And these shrines briefly contained her uh, identities and aspirations until she got to California, where you know her world exploded, as we'll see in a moment. But really extraordinary work, and combining sort of this formalism that she grew up with, this Cubist influence, but also this psychological autobiographical uh, intention that she was seeking in her work. Next. Okay, this is a little different, is it not? So this is right after Shrines. She, is, uh, she goes to California um, with her husband, Paul. He is made the head of Cal Arts, California Institute of Art. He's also an artist, although never really achieves the the renown that uh, Miriam does. And, and from all I can see, they were had a happy marriage for all of her um, inner conflict and questioning the roles that she has to play as artist, mother, parent, uh, et cetera. Uh, their marriage seemed to have been a mutually nourishing one and they worked together uh, when they painted. So this is called um, Painting City. Uh, and the other is uh, Byzantium, again, very celebrated for these floating shapes that she did. They're both acrylics um, and they are powerful. They're large, 80 by 72 uh, is Painting City and 108, that's nine feet by six feet is Byzantium. And you can get, you can imagine their impact up front. And in fact, at the Eric Firestone Gallery, they have one of these geometrical paintings of this kind of size and seeing it up close, where sometimes things don't look as good up close as they do in a picture, it was even more powerful. And so she is now gaining very po positive critical attention for this work. And it's a, a suggestion of her breaking out of the rigid structure that she pursued in the shrines. And again, it coincides with her move to California and it's very much challenging what's happening in American art at the time. Next. Okay, this uh, is in retrospect considered um, the first of her um, feminist uh, pieces of art. Um, 
When we look at it on the one hand, these diagonals seem to represent, as she said, the Vitruvian man with the O and X uh, and seemingly, um, you know, interesting composition. She claims that uh, she was unaware of what she really meant by this as revealed to her by others and herself in the future. She did this piece and others that I'm gonna uh, show you uh, at University of California when she met this physicist named David Nalaboff, uh, who she persuaded to help her with his computer imaging some of her bolder geometric drawings. And this is how this particular piece and the next ones I'm going to show um, uh, how she did it. When she did Big Ox, she uh, may have been uh, unconscious of the gendered content at the time. And that is talking about the big O dead center. Um, one of the critics called it her interest in yonic forms. Um, and she only she says she only recognized it later. And uh, here's what she said. And this was, I guess, on the wall at uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, the plaque. The painting is a very strong image of a seemingly neutral subject. The letter O superimposed on the letter X um, was actually a uh, was actually a hexagon with a pink labial interior whose geometry masked its sexual meaning. In painting this image, I behaved unconsciously like all women artists who are mentored by men. So this is the big ox, and it's really one of her most iconic pieces. And you can imagine, again, it's uh, uh, seven by uh, nine. Uh, it's a big piece of art and it's uh, extraordinarily vibrant. Next, continuing, she then did two other pieces. The keyhole is right now in the uh, Vienna Museum of Vienna and um, Horizontal Woman, I don't know where that's at. Uh, but these two, again, they're extraordinary. Um, they, uh, one of the critics who talked about these two pieces in particular and said that she is working in the vanguard of contemporary abstraction, Barbara Rose. And she called it abstract illusionism of these floating pieces. Keyhole on the left, Again, uh, and this is where the critic used the term yonic forms for the hole in the key at the top. And horizontal woman number two or cartoon. It's, I, don't, I don't know why they had both names, but uh, this is a reclining nude fractured into these geometric forms, uh, almost like a landscape or an assemblage of bungalows. But uh, this is... Uh, two of, again, her iconic pieces from this period when she was in California that was explosive for her, but she's about to move very dramatically, changing genre again, as we will see time after time into what really made her famous uh, next. So uh, 1971, she, um, is teaching some a few students about her ideas of feminine art. And she uh, learns about another artist named Judy Chicago. And maybe some of you have seen her work at the Brooklyn Museum, one of the most famous rooms in American art, Judy Chicago's dinner party, which is I think 36 different women uh, reflected on plates one by one around a big table uh, with vagina imagery. That's Judy Chicago. Judy Chicago uh, and Miriam Shapiro. Miriam Shapiro goes to find her at Fresno and um, invites her to come to Cal Arts to become a member of the faculty and work with her to create the first feminine arts program. 
um, which they do. And they have 21 women, young women who they are training uh, to be artists. And more than artists, they're training to be women. They're young students. And one of the first things they do is build this house from a derelict building called Woman House. And that is um, Miriam and Judy sitting uh, up there at the entrance. And um, it is recognized as the first uh, female center art installation. Well, the article I read claimed in the world, I think I'm uh, safe in saying in America. And the work they did in there was extraordinary. Not only did they build, they had to learn building techniques um, with hammers and nails and saws and the like, but they were creating work that was musical, that was um, visual, uh, that was theatrical. In fact, a very famous uh, piece that Judy Chicago wrote and that was performed there, I will leave it to you to look at, you can find it on video. It's, <laughs> it is really out there. Uh, but um, this was um, viewed by uh, the New York Times as one of, this is in 2019, one of the 25 most important art pieces of the 20th century, Woman House. Uh, next. So while she's there, she does uh, one of her most iconic works called Dollhouse, which is at, uh, in the Smithsonian right now and always has a crowd in front of it. Um, this is like a Rosetta Stone for the rest of her later work. And it combines many things, including a, and specifically a marked ambivalence to a traditional female roles. So at first glance, it seems like a dollhouse and a rejection of abstraction. On closer inspection, which hopefully you'll have a chance, I'm sorry, I missed it uh, when uh, we were in Washington recently, but on closer inspection, it reveals a complexity and a contradiction way beyond the reach of little girl's toys or a woman's place in the home. Each lovingly furnished room is disturbed by some impending menace. A rattlesnake curled up on the parlor floor, a grizzly bear staring through the nursery window at a tiny monster in a crib, mysterious men lurking outside of the kitchen window, and in the bedroom, a naked man wearing only cowboy boots with an erection, modeling for one of Miriam's abstractions on the easel. This is Dollhouse and uh, probably more than any other work, uh, something that uh, Miriam Shapiro is known as. This takes her into her most important phase. Next, Jerry, which is called Fumage. Fumage was a combination of collage, assemblage, and uh, the feminine. And it um, specifically targeted all of the, um, well, it specifically challenged the formalistic canon with which she was obviously very familiar that excluded so much of the content that she was familiar with and wanted to utilize. And she wanted to bring a feminine aesthetic to enact her politics in a political language. Um, so here on the left is a piece called Curtains, which is the first fromage. It combines painting, which is abstract, and fabric on canvas. And it's a large piece, 60 by 70. Next to it is her fabric cabinet. It is the cabinet where she collected all the fabrics that she hoped to, intended to use for her fromage. The content of fromage um, was craft, costume, folk art, surrealism. Uh, it was the lived domestic experience. And it was really to 
um, be manifested in virtually all of her work through the 70s and 80s. And it gave rise to um, the pattern and decoration movement in the mid 70s to 80s that at its time was, according to Holland Carter, uh, chief art critic of the New York Times, the most important and last art movement in America. I, I think that's a overstatement, uh, but um, it influenced a huge number of um, artists and not just uh, women in the end, the p and as it was called movement uh, really engaged the attention of a number of uh, male artists as well. But it literally thousands of women were uh, affected by this because she went around in the 70s, 80s and 90s lecturing on this subject on female art, on feminism, and on the fromage. Next. Okay, so this is a, a brief video. It's only a minute, uh, but I, I enjoyed it, and it sort of highlights <laughs> the male confusion about what this is all about. What I do is I find all these forms from women's culture. Um, do you know what this is? Oh, uh, that looks like a dress. It looks like a... Uh... It looks like a dress. It is a little crochet dress, but it's indeed a, a pot holder. You put your two fingers around it and you hold something that's very hot with it. But look at the care and the beautiful stitchery. And I just want to memorialize this in a, a painting of mine. No. So I bring these women who are anonymous back into history. Did you do things like uh, work with uh, quilts in your art previously? Did you? No, no, because I had uh, the same attitudes toward women's works uh, that uh, everybody else in the culture had. I never saw them as works of particular beauty, nor did I particularly honor my grandmother when she used to sit there tatting those uh, pillow slips, you know, making those beautiful objects. Okay, next, Jerry. What I... So uh, this is a fabulous piece that I also had uh, the good fortune to look at closely, which is there I am inspecting uh, um, in the gallery at Eric Firestone. It's called Lady Genji's Ma Maze. And um, what's extraordinary to me about it, this is she has these, this sort of computer generated image, which harks back to her California days, but flying out of this sort of masculine construction, I think she would have considered, are these fromages. And I am up close, aching to touch one, be, but aware of the brooding omnipresence of the gallerists. Actually, they were lovely, they weren't brooding. Um, but the, the one on the left is uh, as an acrylic. Uh, in the middle is clearly a fabric, as is the one on the right. And they appear to be flying out of the picture. And behind them are these steps, almost like Carrico steps. Who knows where they're going to this gray wall? But um, to me, not only was it visually just an extraordinary creative piece of work that married where she was coming from to where she is going, but it's also sort of her stepping out of confinement. It really, up close, it looks like these are flying out of the picture. Next. So here are classic examples now, again, early in 72 and 73 of her fromages, and they, become um, really symbols of the P&D movement where she's creating abstract compositions, very vibrant colors with hard edged forms like cubism um, that uh, is constituted of quilts, of wallpaper, fabric design. They're unapologetically ornate, but they're grounded in these recognizable uh, elements of fine art. This is a hybrid. This is taking female decorative arts, marrying it to fine art and making the argument, this deserves its place right next to the great contemporary modern work 
that to that point has really been the province of men. Next. Here is called the cabinet for all seasons. It's four season panels, uh, the uh, decorative design and um, feminist Im imagery is combined in these architectural shapes that each have at their center, this mysterious female space that's inviting one in. And uh, again, this is another example that we'll see over and over of uh, what um, Judy Chicago named Miriam's uh, central core imagery. Next. So now it's mid seventies and she uh, does this series of collaborations that are for two purposes and there are many of them and they're uh, the smallest of the work that I saw of hers. Um, they're really almost like intimate pieces of looking internally, having a private view. The, the, but, but they're very different if they're featuring a woman artist or a man. So for illustration, on the left, is Mary Cassatt and me. And she loved Mary Cassatt and saw her as a pioneer and with um, uh, Morisot, one of the, the great artists who challenged the male dominance in, in, in France. And this is a piece she did that is very sympathetic. Um, and she was reflecting on, okay. I have to be mindful of the time. I, I'm going to sound more and more like a New Yorker as we get to the end. Um, anyway, she, you know, being raised in a patriarchal home where her mother didn't have a world view, she sees herself as having a world of her own. And that's what she was saying in this piece. She's quite sympathetic and it validates her own inner life uh, as, as she's described this. Next to it, is uh, uh, part of her collaboration series, Paul Gauguin and me. And Paul Gauguin, I think she saw quite differently with his interest, uh, obsessive interest with Tahitian maidens, always bare breasted. Uh, she sort of reversed things here. It's not really sympathetic. He's sort of in the dark interior, uh, again, that uh, special space and um, he is surrounded by what looks like a kimono or a dress. So um, he is, she has shown him in a different way, but still a collaboration with artists of the past. And we're gonna see coming soon, her collaborations with women artists, especially modern uh, Russian, Russian artists that were the modern artists of the turn of the century in Russia, that is the 20th century, who have never gotten the recognition that she believes they deserve and who, with whom she feels not only an affinity, but a genealogy. Uh, next. These again are femages. These are, were aprons that were sent to her or given to her by women. Uh, she uh, says that she wanted to validate the traditional activities of women to connect myself with the unknown women artists who had done the invisible women's work of civilization. I wanted to acknowledge them. I wanted to honor them. So she began collaborating with anonymous women who sent her stuff. She asked for it. They sent her embroidery and aprons and ribbon and quilts. And as she traveled and lectured, uh, she thanked them and incorporated the stuff that they were sending her uh, in her artwork and with attribution so that in her artist statements, as the work was being shown, she would specifically thank by name the women who sent her these articles, uh, much to the shock of her gallerist, Andre Emmerich, who was apparently aghast. Next. And now we come to really uh, what's called the, the largest femage ever uh, completed. It's called Anatomy of a Kimono. Obviously, uh, the kimono 
and is and and the anatomy and the way it's structured with its hard edge lines. Um, and you can see on top, this is sort of the 50 foot uh, expanse of it. It's the, the only picture that we could find. And I wanna do a shout out before I forget again to Sharon Smith, who's put all of this work together in an extraordinary way. Uh, so I, you know, I really barely recovered from failing to acknowledge that uh, last time. I'm, I'm remorseful, but Sharon's done an amazing job. So here is anatomy of a kimono. These are uh, at the bottom, just some insets of particular pieces of it. You can see how extraordinary is this work. It's acrylic, so she's painted it. And these are pieces of fabric that she's, she's uh, included with this sort of hard edged formalism. Uh, and again, it's a very strong image of a seemingly neutral subject. Uh, she called this her soft symphony in color, a robe for the new woman, uh, linking the formal concerns of high art with a preoccupation of domestic arts. Uh, the kimono was fashioned on uh, the Edo kimono and and typically uh, in, in Japan, the, there's a Japanese motif of four kicks that are repeated through this, which um, suggest a figure walking into the future. And you can see two of the kicks here. Uh, next, Jerry, I think there may be one other, uh, can't see the kicks, but this is an even closer detail of the anatomy of a kimono. And next to this is um, a kimono. Uh, again, you can see this vibrant, just, just um, flying out of the picture of the colors. And a lot of this, by the way, on this presentation, unfortunately, the colors are more muted than they are. This was, uh, so much of her work was so vibrant and creative as you can see the way she's crafted this kimono. Next. So in 1978, she introduces a new motif, a fan. And the fan of course is something that very feminine and um, again, a neutral object that would nobody would really think about as art per se. And she, um, started small, her original pieces were 30, 30 by 22. They became six by 12 foot semicircular collages. Um, and she's taken what seemed to be feminine and trivial and created an ordered and monumental visual structure that is again celebrated around the world. The Barcelona fan is at the Met and uh, the first fan, and that is the first big one she did, is in Zurich. Uh, next. This piece is called Wonderland, and it's um, um, a, a fromage, again, acrylic and fabric. It's enormous. It's 90 by 144. That's 12 feet. There she is on the right on a ladder working on it. So she is painting and she is applying and gluing uh, uh, fabric and paper and whatever else she could use. Uh, one critic called it the uh, monumental domestic manifestation of women's creativity. And I, I'm sure that made uh, Mimi very happy. Next. Okay, she's now moved again in the mid eighties. And this is, a woman that uh, you get the feeling as you look at her work that she is constantly looking for herself and what is her shape. And if she finds that shape, is anybody gonna know it? Are they gonna know who she is? So these pieces um, all reflect her interest in dance and theater. And in the mid eighties, this became a preoccupation of her work and her fromages, and these were all fromages. These were all painted and utilizing fabric, took on a very theatrical look. 
um, she gave, they gave a visual form to her attempts to shape myself and deal as we'll see in all of these with the male and female aspects of her persona. She never um, shook the feeling of her male and female and him, her idealism, she hoped as we'll see in some later work that male and female were gonna be the same. In fact, almost interchangeable. Uh, these uh, in her journal, she calls these dancers who exchange qualities, men and women. So this first one is I'm dancing as fast as I can. Again, look at how large this is, 90 by 144. And the same, same one, master of ceremonies where she is, uh, has these theatrical characters. Again, there's psychological uh, uh, meanings that have been ascribed to them that I won't pretend to go through, but uh, can you imagine these monumental works that um, Mimi Shapiro is creating in her studio in 1985. Next. These are, again, more. These are slightly smaller pieces, uh, but they are celebrative. They are vibrant. They are so much energy to these. And, uh, you know, these are performers um, who are, uh, you know, uh, exuberant, dancing, high stepping, falling freely. Uh, this is other famages. And this, uh, actually these, as I'm looking, were acrylics. So they were not famages. These were painted on paper. Next. Uh, more of the same, uh, pas de deux, which uh, then becomes, um, the model for a monumental sculpture that she does uh, next. This is called Anna and David. I don't know to whom it refers, but this is in Rosslyn, Virginia, 35 foot tall Corten steel that models Pa de Deux that was commissioned by the city. And she's had many commissioned works, but uh, this, this one was uh, most extraordinary, I thought. Next. Again, here's a different look. This now, these are performers and uh, one called Ragtime and one called The Blue Angel after Marlon Dietrich, um, both similar size, large, um, <laughs> but fabulous. I think you'd agree. And, uh, and in both cases, you have these women that are sitting confidently engaging the spectators and sort of challenging the masculine context that's put them in these roles. Next. This is a series that she did called The Mythic Pool where she is dealing uh, extraordinarily with the subject of marriage which uh, in the view of these pieces is not necessarily made of heaven or it's certainly imperfectly in the garden. She is uh, in um, on the left feminine masquerade, elegant dress, heels, etc., And he is in a striped suit, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, which suggests anyway that he is as a man imprisoned by time and his own psychological apparatus. And we see the same thing in the second piece called uh, Garden of Eden. Next. So now um, uh, we move into another phase uh, in the late eighties. She um, is uh, absolutely obsessed with Frida Kahlo, who she feels a kinship towards a genealogy with um, she remarks on her Latin Jewish face and unbeknownst to me, but apparently uh, Frida Kahlo was Jewish or had Jewish ancestry, didn't know that. Um, but she, uh, and she describes her face as uh, strong, beautiful Latin and Jewish. Uh, this collaboration series, and she did many pieces and 
we'll go through them quickly, but you'll see um, how extraordinary is, are these depictions. <laughs> she did these intermittently from 1986 to 1991. And she uh, uh, viewed Frida Kahlo as not only an extraordinary painter, but uh, uh, a woman who decided long ago to be a painter, no matter what it cost her, and uh, one who understood and lived with in her own house of pain, physical pain, which was tremendous, as well as uh, <laughs> suffering the indignity of uh, not being recognized and not being considered, uh, particularly married to off and on with Diego Rivera. So these were all, again, large scale pieces. Look at the size of this. This is six by 13 feet um, in size. And, um, and all of them different from the other fromages where she might use a cutout of an artist's face. She painted all of Frida Kahlo's faces in these uh, herself. Next. These are more. This is a presentation, Frida Kahlo. Arts and rafts, where she has all these symbols that are remind her of or are reminiscent or indicative of Frida Kahlo's life. And I believe the red face to my mind, uh, reflects uh, a certain pain and anger. And that expression seems to reflect that as well. Next. Uh, this is in the Brooklyn Museum of Art, which I am now very intent on seeing, called Agony in the Garden. And again, being very sympathetic to, and, and wrapped in things, I mean, she, really required uh, artificial supports. She had terrible pains in her back, multiple operations, which is indicated by, you know, going right down the middle of her chest and stomach. Um, and this is Agony in the Garden, Frida Kahlo. And I think this may be the, uh, one of the last pieces that she did. Next. This is uh, uh, also Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, uh, they seem to be happy and dancing and um, they did love each other and they needed each other and they made each other miserable. So love's labor uh, suggests that there was love and it was a struggle. And uh, she did this very humorous piece called Punch and Judy Show, Frida and Diego in 1990. And interestingly, she put the picture of Frida on the punch character and Diego on the Judy character. Next. This was uh, uh, called Time, and this was based on Frida Kahlo's self-portrait called Self-Portrait with Cropped Hair. It's really uh, unusual and strange, and there's so many different interpretations of this piece, but it certainly looks um, not celebrative. Uh, this Frida Kahlo figure that's purple, it's almost funereal. She's dressed in a man's outfit um, and uh, time is maybe out of time, lost status. And uh, she is next to this younger woman who has her palette maybe, blood red palette, who is sexy and young and um, almost mocking uh, the figure seated in the chair. Next. Okay, now we move into uh, another collaboration where um, she is uh, highlighting uh, and painting, and these are um, uh, lithographs she did um, of Deloney, uh, Concha Rova, and uh, Popova, and me. And even as I say that, I don't necessarily see the me here because the me does appear in a number of these collaborations. And these are celebrated women artists from Russia with whom she fiercely uh, claims uh, kinship. And, and yet they, were, uh, they have been forgotten and they were quite celebrated and extraordinary 
painting in the 1910 to 1920 period when there was this burst of freedom and women artists in Russia were as highly recognized and celebrated as men. Next. Uh, this is a great piece she calls yard sale. These are disclosed, discarded clothes like in a yard sale that are converted into four grand costumes that are framed by these classic columns. On the left is supposedly Frida Kahlo. On the right is Delauney, um, the mature Delauney, or maybe it's Mimi Shapiro. She leaves that open. And in the middle is Stepanova, who was famous for her politics and art and created uh, sometimes the sport costumes. So this is called yard sale. Again, celebrating this lineage of great women artists. Next. Oh, I love this. This is called, she flies through the air with the greatest of ease. This is supposedly Stepanova with the star on her chest. It also could be Mimi who uh, she identifies this Russian guy uh, who is uh, illustrating perfectly manspread that you've all seen time and again. And uh, she is, you know, reaching for his crotch and he has this <laughs> shocked and horrified look on his face. Again, uh, she has identified him, the man as the culprit who's denied her place in the histories of culture, speaking again of these women artists from Russia, but Mimi is speaking women, women artists everywhere. And uh, my fan is a half circle is um, based on a costume design that was done in 1928 at the Moscow Caverny Theater on a production of Romeo and Juliet and it is beautiful, it is idealized, and it almost refers back to the kimono series. Next. This is a part of uh, um, Shapiro's collaboration series. It's called Mother Russia. Again, it's monumental six by 12. Uh, it combines her grid structure to showcase her genealogy of her female artist ancestors. It's mixed media. She uses uh, um, different levels of information showing both her work, their work and other aspects of their life. And all the way at the bottom on the right is uh, Mimi Shapiro herself with a, a picture of her that her students did of her when she was at Woman House that they thought was very funny and she uses it and it'll pop up in many pieces that she does as we're, we're gonna see in addition to this. And uh, next, um, this uh, on the left, uh, which is um, Russian matrix, she uses the word matrix very specifically. This is a form that she's repeated 16 mirrors. She's done any number of ways in the past, but she says, quote, specifically by matrix, she means the womb, that which gives origin of form. And next to it, called the stronger vessel. And these are, again, Russian women, artists that she wants to celebrate and highlight. And there she is on the right in the uh, second row, same picture. Uh, the stronger vessel on the right, six of her heroines with her uh, in the bottom in the middle, uh, Delauni, Goncharova, Popova, Stepanova, Exter and Muchkina have blossomed into this magnificent bouquet. And she's included, once again, pointing out the genealogy of Russian artists and herself. Next. We're in the 90s, we're towards the end of the 90s. And she is now coming to grips with her own identity 
And this is the first time father and daughter that she's acknowledging her father's role in her work. He was her teacher, her first teacher and her mentor and encouraged her strongly for her whole career. Uh, so here he is holding her hand, extending with the other hand a uh, flower to her. They're dancing, it appears, in some syncopation on a paint smeared uh, floor. To the right is the house that where her mother is. So she wants to um, pay homage to her mother who was always uh, inside. Uh, but this is uh, pretty notable, 1997. Um, and uh, she's really coming to the end of her career, the last decade of her life. Very sadly, she suffered from dementia, which uh, some art critics point out, um, Mira Shaw in particular, feel it's one of the reasons that she is less known than she should be, far less, because she sort of disappeared from the scene and was silenced by her disease. This last uh, frame, My History, also done in 1997, uh, which I think is extraordinary, is one of the few times, and here it is at the end of her career, where she is recognizing her history as a Jew. And there are 20 compartments of these fragmented memories. There's the menorah on the pediment, the central axis through to the bottom have the words for Jew in French, Dutch, and German. There's the Star of David. There's the Chala cover, which is needlework, which is Fromage. There is Chagall and his friends, Frida Kahlo, who she puts here specifically, again, making the point that she was Jewish. Um, and you also have Alice B. Toklas, Gertrude Stein, uh, this is my history, reminding herself in her art of uh, who she is. Again, pursuing identity, uh, next. And this is the last, one of the last pieces she does, which was in 2006, she died in 2015 and she was ill at this point. So it's uh, smaller than her big fans, and it's called Ma Miriam's Life with Dolls. She loved dolls, and she loved to tell a story that uh, she heard from her grandfather that these Japanese um, nuns, she called them, in a convent in Japan felt they were there, and it was their responsibility to take care of the souls of the dolls. And this is Miriam's Life with Dolls, really one of her last works. And so uh, now we are going to hear next from Miriam. And this is in 2006 or 2008, um, which is really close to the end of her creative life. When I finally began to be part of the women's movement, uh, it was the first time in my life when I saw what it meant to be connected to other people. And as time went on, I realized how much I had to give. Women were supposed to be in a certain way. I used to call it the period of white gloves because if you didn't go out with your husband uh, to, the, to the restaurant and you didn't wear your white gloves, then people would look at you because you were out of line. There were rules and uh, and the rules were not the women's rules at all. They were the men's rules. There was no such thing as a specific art by women. 
The story of Women House is about Judy Chicago and myself beginning an art course for women to make women understand that in order to be artists, they had to find their identity, as well as working hard to learn how to create images that came from their belief system. I mean, they didn't even know what a belief system was. I mean, there was so much to teach, you know. Ultimately, they were creating their own autobiographies. This uh, young woman brought a, uh, it was a box that she made. And in the box she had, it was very delicate and very uh, moving. It was her first uh, bra. And the bra moved down like this. And the box was made nicely. And suddenly I thought about all the art, you know, that people studied in schools and who in God's name ever brought that to school, you know, as their, as, as what they thought was important, but it was important. It was so important because it was the beginning of whatever her identity would be. I always had a thought of a woman like myself who's standing in the kitchen. She's washing all the dishes. And uh, what's she thinking about then? What would it be like to have a, a story to tell? What would it be like if you, if you had a certain kind of dress on? What would it be like to move your body around? I was myself dealing with my identity. I was innocent at that time in my life. I was older, but I was still innocent. It's now in 2006, uh, those of us who are feminist women are well known for uh, paintings that tell the stories of women's lives. And you see how simple it was. <laughs> Fabulous, right? Uh, Thanks, Jerry. So this is the last slide. And I think this may be the last work that she did. Uh, both of them look like her famages, but they're both acrylics that she painted in 2008. We've looked through an inventory of her work, all of her known work. These appear to be the last two pieces of hers, still extraordinarily skillful, but very sadly, soon to disappear into the fog of dementia. But uh, and this concludes, you know, the story of this extraordinary artist. And I hope you um, agree with me that she was monumental to American art. And uh, uh, so how extraordinary that she's so uh, unknown, really, although Right now, she's got a number of shows that are happening around the country, and she's increasingly exhibited that I've seen since 2019. But uh, thank you for listening and uh, meeting Mimi Shapiro. David, thank you so much on behalf of all of us. You are a treasure to bring <laughs> us this wonderful, wonderful knowledge. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, and, and we can unmute if anybody has questions. I will say that uh, it's a privilege for me because you dive into the life of these extraordinary people who you never knew before. And it just, it's a gift. You meet somebody that has, is so enriching that you never knew before. So no, I love doing this. And again, Sharon, can hear me say, I love doing this. I'm not sure she does, but 
Uh, you'll agree she did a marvelous job. David, hey, David. I, I just wanted to comment that the X's appeared in quite a number of her works. Right. I took yeah. note of that. Yep, it's a repeating motif. I mean, yep. there's a number of things that repeat. There is the, it's sort of this, uh, well, she has her, what she called the phallic symbolism and the, and the, the woman's center, and you see it all the way through her art. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, I think at the Le Long Gallery, uh, drawings uh, against the Vietnam War, like a bunch of planes and very bloody, beautiful small drawings, beautiful. Hi, Giselle. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea about her, her, the scope of her work. Uh, wonderful presentation. Yeah, Thank six you. Six decades, constantly changing. Amazing. Isn't it amazing when artists that are so great in one particular genre are willing to risk it all and do something totally different, that they're yeah. just so moved to do it. When we were in the gallery the other day, looking at her work close up, and I was reflecting that maybe she would have been even more famous if she just did these geometric compositions. They're spectacular. And the gallerist said, she was great in all the things she did. She, don't, don't limit her. Yeah, and just uh, 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 audacity to make such big works already is an attitude. Uh, it's an attitude. Like, yeah, yeah. Going right at him. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> David, is there going to be a collection uh, of all of her works in one gallery somewhere that, I mean, I thought the or narrative. The volume. Huh, the volume, or, yeah. or but I thought the, the narrative that you gave was very helpful in terms of just starting from the beginning and then moving to the end and then having that wonderful uh, statement by her. Yeah. Is there uh, any one place where that's going to ever? Uh, you... um, at the at the Eric Firestone Gallery, which is on uh, for uh, Great Jones, they have work and they also have work in their gallery in uh, East Hampton. I don't know, is anybody from the Eric Firestone on? Um, I think I saw in the beginning. Anyway, uh, so they have some work that again was a knockout, but otherwise probably any museum you go to, if you ask for, even if it's not being exhibited for an inventory of work, you'll find her work. Oh. I believe the Morgan Gallery has acquired with a, given a gift of the Rondo series, of ah. her, which has you know, a numerous um, uh, acrylics of her um, paint, of her dancing scenes that were right. very famous. This is <laughs> also a book of uh, her Rondo series, and that that was given, I think, uh, within just recently, within the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, you'll you'll find her work everywhere. It's sort of been under the radar. It certainly was for me. Although when I first saw it, it just knocked me out. I knew that I wanted to do uh, Miriam Shapiro, who I put right up there with Frankenthaler and Rothko and Sean and, yeah. and everybody else that I've uh, uh, addressed in the past. And I'm sure she'd love the fact that you, as, as, a, as a male, talking about this wonderful woman. <laughs> I must feel, I, I have to say, I have felt over the course of this under, uh, uh, ill-equipped for this, but you know, what are you gonna do? We appreciate it, I appreciate it, thank you. Uh, you have a wonderful mother to, uh, to give you the introduction to how women can be. Hi, yes, and, and, and there is my mom right now, hey ma. <laughs> yes, uh, my and my mother, not only is she a triple threat, she sings and dances and performs, but she's also sculpted and she's amazing at almost 97 now uh, with that white right. mane. So yeah, you're, you're the top, Ma. Uh, Jeff, 
Hey, Sheila. Anybody, anybody else? Your mom is speaking, but she's muted. Oh, I'm, oh, uh oh, putting, she, you know, we had to mute her because before she didn't know how to mute and she kept interrupting my broadcast. We kept, I kept saying, Ma, you're, you're interrupting me. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't know, Ma, if you can unmute, if you have something to say, I would, we'd love to hear it, but trying to read lips. <laughs> yeah, there's a symbol the, of the microphone with a line uh, through it, Billy. On the bottom left. Um, on the bottom left, it's a microphone. So you press on that and the line goes away so you can speak. <laughs> no. Okay, next Keep time. <laughs> okay, well. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about Miriam was also her love of colors and especially pink and its hues. So you often see that, of right. course, all those reds, but definitely a pink there, right. especially in her ex. Correct. Yeah, and most famously, the big O, the big the ox. Big, the big ox, absolutely. She was me in the pink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just add about the color because I'm glad you said that because I thought her use of color, uh, the whole range of colors is so bold and courageous, um, often associated with men like Matisse and Gauguin and Cezanne, but it's, it's just right there, bold, bold as uh, could be. Yeah, and she, you know, she said... She loved Matisse. She loved Picasso. He was her hero. She studied everything about him. Uh, Cubism really informed her earliest love of art, but yeah. she was memifying all of them. And she was standing right up to them, really at her earliest time working in New York. The other thing I remember about um, Shapiro was, Mimi Appleseed. Yes. Mimi Appleseed. Yes. Because she, she wanted to spread that color and that variety. Not only that, but she went around the country teaching feminism to women. Right. And she was called Mimi Appleseed. Uh -huh. Great point. Uh -huh. Thank you, David. Okay, well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to everybody. <laughs> See you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.